in the case in which we are now so deeply occupied and over which our hearts are etching, in the present case, the father, Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov, did not correspond to that concern. That's the misfortune. And indeed some fathers are a misfortune. Let us examine this misfortune rather more closely. We must shrink from nothing, gentlemen of the jury, considering the importance of the decision you have to make. It's our particular duty not to shrink from any idea, like children or frightened women, as the talented prosecutor happily expresses it. But in the course of his heated speech my esteemed opponent, and he was my opponent before I opened my lips, exclaimed several times, Oh, I will not yield the defense of the prisoner to the lawyer, I accuse. But I defend him. He thirsted perhaps to see his father after long years of separation. A thousand times perhaps he may, recalling his childhood, have driven away the loathsome phantoms that haunted his childish dreams, and with all his heart he may have longed to embrace and to forgive. He heard nothing but revolting talk and vicious precepts uttered daily over the brandy, and at last he saw his father seducing his mistress from him with his own money. O oh, gentlemen of the jury, that was cruel and revolting, and that old man was always complaining of the disrespect and cruelty of his son. He slandered him in society, injured him, calumniated him, bought up his unpaid debts to get him thrown into prison. Gentlemen of the jury, people like my client, who are fierce, unruly, and uncontrolled on the surface, are sometimes, most frequently indeed, exceeding. Don't laugh, don't laugh at my idea. The talented prosecutor laughed mercilessly just now at my client for loving still or loving the sublime and beautiful. I should not have laughed at Yes, such natures, oh, let me speak in defense of such natures. So often, and so cruelly misunderstood these natures, often thirst for tenderness, passionate and fierce on the surface. They are painfully capable of loving woman, for instance, and with a spiritual and elevated love. Again, do not laugh at me. This is very often the case in such natures. But they cannot hide their passions, sometimes very coarse, and that is conspicuous and is noticed, but the inner man is unseen. Their passions are quickly exhausted. But, by the side of a noble and lofty creature that seemingly coarse and rough man seeks a new life, seeks to correct himself, to be... I said just now that I would not venture to touch upon my client's engagement, but I may say half a word. What we heard just now was not evidence, but only the scream of a frenzied and revengeful woman, and it was not for her, oh, not for her, to reproach him with treachery, for she has betrayed... Oh, do not believe her, no, my client is not a monster. As she called him, the lover of mankind on the eve of his crucifixion said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, so that not one of them might be lost. Let not a man's soul be lost through us, I ask just now what does father mean, but one must use words honestly, gentlemen, and I venture to call things by their right names, such a father as old Karamazov cannot be called a father and does not deserve to be. Filial love for an unworthy father is an absurdity, an impossibility. Love cannot be created from nothing. Only God can create something from nothing. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, the Apostle writes, from a heart glowing with love. It's not for the sake of my client that I quote these sacred words. I mention them for all fathers. Who has authorized me to preach to fathers? No one. But as a man and a citizen I make my appeal, vivas voco. We are not long on earth. We do many evil deeds and say many evil words. So let us all catch a favorable moment when we are all together to say a good word to each other. That's what I am doing. While I am in this place, I take advantage of my opportunity. Not for nothing is this tribune given us by the highest authority. All Russia hears us. I am not speaking only for the fathers here present. I cry aloud to all fathers. Father. Otherwise, we are not fathers, but enemies of our children. 
and they are not our children but our enemies, and we have made them our enemies ourselves. What measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. It's not I who say that. It's the gospel percept. Measure to others according as they measure to you. How can we blame children if they measure us according to our measure? Not long ago a servant girl in Finland was suspected of having secretly given birth to a child. She was watched, and a box of which no one knew anything was found in the corner of the loft, behind some bricks. It was opened and inside was found the body of a newborn child which she had killed. In the same box were found the skeletons of two other babies which, according to her own confession, she had killed at the moment of their birth. Gentlemen of the jury, was she a mother to her children? She gave birth to them, indeed. But was she a mother to them? Would any one venture to give her the sacred name of... No, let us prove that the progress of the last few years has touched even us, and let us say plainly, the father is not merely he who begets the child, but he who begets it. Oh, of course, there is the other meaning. There is the other interpretation of the word father, which insists that any father, even though he be a monster, even though he be the enemy of his child, but this is so to say, the mystical meaning which I cannot comprehend with my intellect, but can only accept by faith, or, better to say, on faith, like many others, but in that case let it be kept outside the sphere of actual life. In the sphere of actual life, which has, indeed, its own rights, but also lays upon us great duties and obligations, in that sphere, if we want to be humane, then it will be real Christian work, not only mystic, but rational and philanthropic. There was violent applause at this passage from many parts of the court, but Fetukovich waved his hand. The court relapsed into silence at once. The orator went on. Do you suppose, gentlemen, that our children as they grow up and begin to reason can avoid such questions? No, they cannot, and we will not impose on them an impossible the sight of an unworthy father involuntarily suggests tormenting questions to a young creature, especially when he compares him with the excellent fathers of his companions. The conventional answer to this question is, He begot you, and you are his flesh and blood, and therefore you are bound to love him. The youth involuntarily reflects, Was it for my sake he begot me? He did not know me, not even my sex. At that moment, at the moment of passion, perhaps inflamed by wine, and he has only transmitted to me, why am I bound to love him simply for begetting me when he has cared nothing for me all my life after? Oh, perhaps those questions strike you as coarse and cruel, but do not expect an imp Drive nature out of the door, and it will fly in at the window. And, above all, let us not be afraid of words, but decide the question according to the dictates of reason and humanity. How shall it be decided? Why, like this. Let the son stand before his father and ask him, Father, tell me, why must I love you, father? Show me that I must love you. And if that father is able to answer him and show him, but if he does not, there is an end to the family tie. He is not a father to him, and the son has a right to look upon him as a stranger, and even an enemy. Our tribune, gentlemen of the jury, ought to be a school of true and sound ideas. Here the orator was interrupted by irrepressible and almost frantic applause. Of course, it was not the whole audience, but a good half of it applauded. The fathers and mothers present applauded. Shrieks and exclamations were heard from the gallery, where the ladies were sitting. Handkerchiefs were waved. The president began ringing his bell with all his might. He was obviously irritated by the behavior of the audience, but did not venture to clear the court as he had threatened. Even persons of high position, old men with stars on their breasts, sitting on specially reserved seats behind the judges, applauded the orator and waved their handkerchiefs, so that when the noise died down, the president confined himself to repeating his stern threat to clear the court, and Fetukovich, excited and triumphant, continued his speech. I insist most emphatically it was not for money he ran to his father's house. The charge of robbery is an absurdity. 
as I proved before. And it was not to murder him he broke into the house. Oh, no, oh, if he had had that design he would, at least, have taken the precaution of arming himself beforehand. The brass pestle he caught up instinctively without knowing why he did it. Granted that he deceived his father by tapping at the window. Granted that he made his way in, I've said already that I do not for a moment believe that legend, but let it be so, let us suppose. Gentlemen, I swear to you by all that's holy, if it had not been his father, but an ordinary enemy he would, after running through the rooms and satisfying himself that the woman was not there, he would have struck him, pushed him away perhaps nothing more, for he had no thought and no time to spare for that. What he wanted to know was where she was. But his father, his father, the mere sight of the father who had hated him from his childhood, had been his enemy, his persecutor, and now his unnatural rival. Was it all surged up in one moment. It was an impulse of madness and insanity, but also an impulse of nature, irresistibly and unconsciously, like everything in but the prisoner even then did not murder him, I maintain that, I cry that aloud. No, he only brandished the pestle in a burst of indignant disgust, not meaning to kill him. Had he not had this fatal pestle in his hand, he would have only knocked his father down perhaps, but would not have killed him. As he ran away, he did not know whether he had killed the old man. Such a murder is not a murder. Such a murder is not a parasite. No. The murder of such a father cannot be called parasite. Such a murder can only be reckoned parasite by prejudice. But I appeal to you again and again from the depths of my soul. Did this murder actually take place, gentlemen of the jury, if we convict and punish him, he will say to himself, These people have not given me to eat and to drink, have not visited me in prison and nakedness, and here they have sent me to penal servitude. I am quits. I owe them nothing now, and owe no one anything for ever. They are wicked, and I will be wicked. They are cruel, and I will be cruel. That is what he will say, gentlemen of the jury. And I swear, by finding him guilty, you will only make it easier for him. You will ease his conscience. He will curse the blood he has shed, and will not regret it. At the same time, you will destroy in him the possibility of becoming a new man, for he will remain in his wickedness and blindness all his life. But do you want to punish him fearfully, terribly, with the most awful punishment that could be imagined, and at the same time to save him and regenerate his soul? If so, overwhelm How can I endure this mercy? How can I endure so much love? Am I worthy of it? That's what he will exclaim. Oh, I know. I know that heart, that wild but grateful heart, gentlemen of the jury, it will bow before your mercy. It thirsts for a great and loving action. There are souls which in their limitation blame the whole world, but subdue such a soul with mercy, show it love, and it will curse its past, for there are many good impulses in it. Such a heart will expand and see that God is merciful and that men are good and just. He will be horror-stricken. He will be crushed by remorse and the vast obligation laid upon him henceforth. And he will not say then, I am quits, but will say, I am guilty in the sight of all men, and am more unworthy than all. With tears of penitence and poignant, if this is true, if Russia and her justice are such, she may go forward with good cheer, do not try to scare us with your frenzied troikas from which all the nations stand aside in disgust. Not a runaway troika, but the stately chariot of Russia will move calmly and majestically to its goal. In your hands is the fate of my client. In your hands is the fate of Russian justice. You will defend it. You will save it. You will prove that there are men to watch over it, that it is in good hands. Chapter Ksiv. The peasants stand firm. This was how Fetukovich concluded his speech, and the enthusiasm of the audience burst like an irresistible storm. It was out of the question to stop it. The women wept. Many of the men wept, too. Even two important personages shed tears. The president submitted, and even postponed ringing his bell. 
The suppression of such an enthusiasm would be the suppression of something sacred, as the ladies cried afterwards. The orator himself was genuinely touched. And it was at this moment that Ippolit Kirilovich got up to make certain objections. People looked at him with hatred. What? What's the meaning of it? He positively dares to make objections. The ladies babbled. But if the whole world of ladies, including his wife, had protested he could not have been stopped at that moment. He was pale. He was shaking with emotion. His first phrases were even inintelligible. He gasped for brief, could hardly speak clearly, lost the thread. But he soon recovered himself. Of this new speech of his I will quote only a few sentences. I am reproached with having woven a romance. But what is this defense if not one romance on the top of another? All that was lacking was poetry. Fyodor Pavlovich, while waiting for his mistress, tears open the envelope and throws it on the floor. We are even told what he said while engaged in this strange act. Is not this a flight of fancy? And what proof have we that he had taken out the money? Who heard what he said? The weak-minded idiot Smerdyakov transformed into a by If he murdered him, he murdered him, and what's the meaning of his murdering him without having murdered him? Who can make head or tail of this? Then we are admonished that our truth, the most precious, the most sacred guarantees for the destiny and future of Russian justice are presented to us in a perverted and frivolous form, simply to attain an object. Oh, crush him by mercy, cries the counsel for the defense. But that's all the criminal wants, and tomorrow it will be seen how much he is crushed. And is not the counsel for the defense too modest in asking only for the acquittal of the prisoner? Why not found a charity in the honor of the parricide to commemorate his exploit among future generations? And so, as it is, as it is. Before us a false sambus. This is what our God has taught us, and not that to forbid children to murder their fathers is a prejudice. And we will not from the tribune of truth and good sense correct the gospel of our Lord, whom the counsel for the defense deigns to call only the crucified lover of humanity, in opposition to all or the audience, too, was uneasy. The public was restless. There were even exclamations of indignation. Fetukovich did not so much as replay. He only mounted the tribune to lay his hand on his heart and, with an offended voice, utter a few words full of dignity. He only touched again, lightly and ironically, on romancing and psychology, and in an appropriate place quoted Jupiter, You are angry, therefore you are wrong. Then, a propos of the accusation that he was teaching the young generation to murder their fathers, Fetukovich observed, with great dignity, that he would not even answer. As for the prosecutor's charge of uttering unorthodox opinions, Fetukovich hinted that it was a personal insinuation, and that he had expected in this court to be secure from accusations demanding. And Ippolit Kirilovich was, in the opinion of our ladies, crushed for good, then the prisoner was allowed to speak. Mitya stood up, but said very little. He was fearfully exhausted, physically and mentally. The look of strength and independence with which he had entered in the morning had almost disappeared. He seemed as though he had passed through an experience that day, which had taught him for the rest of his life something very important he had not understood till then. His voice was weak. He did not shout as before. In his words there was a new note of humility, defeat, and submission. What am I to say, gentlemen of the jury? The hour of judgment has come for me. I feel the hand of God upon me. The end has come to an erring man, but, before God, every instant I strove to reform. But I lived like a wild beast. I thank the prosecutor. He told me many things about myself that I did not know. But it's not true that I killed my father. The prosecutor is mistaken. I thank my counsel, too. I cried listening to him. But it's not true that I killed my father. And he needn't have supposed it. And don't believe the doctors. 
I am perfectly sane. Only my heart is heavy. If you spare me, if you let me go, I will pray for you. I will be a better man. I give you my word before God I will. And if you will condemn me, I'll break my sword over my head myself and kiss the pieces. But spare me, do not rob me of my God. I know myself, I shall read bull. My heart is heavy, gentlemen. Spare me. He almost fell back in his place. His voice broke. He could hardly articulate the last phrase. Then the judges proceeded to put the questions and began to ask both sides to formulate their conclusions. But I will not describe the details. At last the jury rose to retire for consultation. The president was very tired, and so his last charge to the jury was rather feeble. Be impartial, don't be influenced by the eloquence of the defense, but yet weigh the arguments. Remember that there is a great responsibility laid upon you, and so on and so on. The jury withdrew and the court adjourned. People could get up, move about, exchange their accumulated impressions, refresh themselves at the buffet. It was very late, almost one o'clock in the night, but nobody went away. The strain was so great that no one could think of repose. All waited with sinking hearts, though that is perhaps too much to say, for the ladies were only in a state of hysterical impatience and their hearts were untroubled. An acquittal, they thought, was inevitable. They all prepared themselves for a dramatic moment of general enthusiasm. I must own there were many among the men, too, who were convinced that an acquittal was inevitable. Some were pleased, others frowned, while some were simply dejected, not wanting him to be acquitted. Fetyukovich himself was confident of his success. He was surrounded by people congratulating him and fawning upon him. There are, he said to one group, as I was told afterwards, there are invisible threads binding the counsel for the defense with the jury. One feels during one's speech if they are being formed. I was aware of them. They exist. Our cause is one. Set your mind at rest. What will our peasants say now? Said one stout, cross-looking, pock-marked gentleman, a landowner of the neighborhood, approaching a group, but they are not all peasants. There are four government clerks among them. Yes, there are clerks, said a member of the district council, joining the group. And do you know that Nazariev, the merchant with the medal, a juryman? What of him? He is a man with brains, but he never speaks. He is no great talker, but so much the there's no need for the Petersburg man to teach him. He could teach all Petersburg himself. He's the father of twelve children. Think of that upon my word. You don't suppose they want to quit him? One of our young officials exclaimed in another group. They'll acquit him for certain, said a resolute voice. It would be shameful, disgraceful, not to acquit him, cried the official. Suppose he did murder him, there are fathers and fathers, and besides, he was in such a frenzy. He really may have done nothing but swing the pestle in the air, and so knocked the old man down. But it was a pity they dragged the valetin. That was simply an absurd theory. If I'd been in Fetukovich's place, I should simply have said straight out, he murdered him, but he is not guilty, hang it all. That's what he... Why, gentlemen... In Lent, an actress was acquitted in our town who had cut the throat of her lover's lawful wife. Oh, but she did not finish cutting it. That makes no difference. She began cutting it. What did you think of what he said about children? Splendid. Wasn't it splendid? And about mysticism, too. Oh, drop mis- His wife will scratch his eyes out tomorrow for Mitya's sake. Is she here? What an idea! If she'd been here, she'd have scratched them out in court. She is at home with Toothatch. He 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 in a third group. I dare say they will acquit Matenka, after all. I should not be surprised if he turns the metropolis upside down tomorrow. He will be drinking for ten days. Oh, the devil. The devil's bound to have a hand in it. Where should he be if not here? Well, gentlemen, I admit it was eloquent. 
but still it's not the thing to break your father's head with a pestle. What are we coming to? The chariot? Do you remember the chariot? Yes. He turned a cart into a chariot. The jury deliberated for exactly an hour, neither more nor less. A profound silence reigned in the court as soon as the public had taken their seats. I remember how the jurymen walked into the court. At last, I won't repeat the questions in order, and, indeed, I have forgotten them. I remember only the answer to the President's first and chief question. Did the prisoner commit the murder for the sake of robbery and with premeditation? I don't remember the exact words. There was the foreman of the jury, the youngest of the clerks, pronounced in a clear, loud voice, amidst the death-like stillness of the court. Yes, guilty. And this, this no one had expected. Almost every one had reckoned upon a recommendation to mercy, at least. The death-like silence in the court was not broken, all seemed petrified. Those who desired his conviction as well as those who had been eager for his acquittal. But that was only for the first instant, and it was followed by a fearful hubbub. Many of the men in the audience were pleased. Some were rubbing their hands with no attempt to conceal their joy. Those who disagreed with the verdict seemed crushed, shrugged their shoulders, whispered, but still seemed unable to realize this. But how shall I describe the state the ladies were in? I thought they would create a right. At first they could scarcely believe their ears. Then suddenly the whole court rang with exclamations. What's the meaning of it? What next? They leaped up from their places. They seemed to fancy that it might be at once reconsidered and reversed. At that instant Mitya suddenly stood up and cried in a heart-rending voice, stretching his hands out before him. I swear by God, and the dreadful day of judgment I am From the farthest corner, at the back of the gallery, came a piercing shriek. It was Grushenka. She had succeeded in begging admittance to the court again before the beginning of the lawyer's speeches. Mitya was taken away. The passing of the sentence was deferred till next day. The whole court was in a hubbub, but I did not wait to hear. I only remember a few exclamations I heard on the steps as I went out. He'll have a twenty years' trip to the mines, not less. Well, our peasants have stood firm, and have done for our Mitya. Epilogue Chapter I Plans for Mitya's escape very early. At nine o'clock in the morning, five days after the trial, Alyosha went to Katerina Ivanovna's to talk over a matter of great importance to her. She sat and talked to him in the very room in which she had once received Grushenka. In the next room, Ivan Fyodorovich lay unconscious in a high fever. Katerina Ivanovna had immediately after the scene at the trial ordered the sick and unconscious man to be carried to her house, disregarding the inevitable gossip and general disapproval of the public. One of the two relations who lived with her had departed to Moscow immediately after the scene in court, the other remained. But if both had gone away, Katerina Ivanovna would have adhered to her resolution, and would have gone on nursing the sick man and sitting by him day and night. Varvinsky and hers and Stu were attending him. The famous doctor had gone back to Moscow, refusing to give an opinion as to the probable end of the illness. Though the doctors encouraged Katerina Ivanovna and Alyosha, it was evident that they could not yet give them positive hopes of recovery. Alyosha came to see his sick brother twice a day, but this time he had specially urgent business, and he foresaw how difficult it would be to approach the subject, yet he was in great haste. He had another engagement that could not be put off for that same morning, and there was need of haste. They had been talking for a quarter of an hour. Katerina Ivanovna was pale and terribly fatigued, yet at the same time in a state of hysterical excitement. She had a presentiment of the reason why Alyosha had come to her. Don't worry about his decision, she said with confident emphasis to Alyosha. One way or another he is bound to come to it. He must escape. That unhappy man, that hero of honor and principle, not he, not Dmitri Fyodorovich, but the man lying the other side of that door, who has sacrificed himself for his brother. You know he has already entered into negotiations. 
I've told you something already. Of some something already. Already.